Hello, friends. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. This is the first panel of uh, 2020. And uh, I'm pretty happy to see an all-woman panel as the first panel of 2020. So first of all, Happy New Year to everyone. And we have Kat Heinrich today, who is the moderator. We're going to talk about circular food. This is the second panel that Kat is moderating for us. If you haven't seen the first one, which was on food waste legislation, please head to the video panel section of our website and you will find it there. And uh, Kat is a food waste specialist in Australia. Today, we also have Olympia, who is the founder and CEO of Goterra. She's a farmer, innovator, and a leader in insect farming in Australia. We also have Karen, who's the head of research at Feedback, which is a UK-based campaign group. And as always, we will be taking questions, and uh, Kat will be taking the questions in the last 15 to 20 minutes of the panel. It's, our panel is gonna be for an hour totally. So please use the Q&A section, start putting in your questions as and when you get them, you do not have to wait for the last 20 minutes. So uh, thank you so much for tuning in and thanks to our panelists. So over to you, Kat. Thank you very much for the introduction, Swetha. Uh, so as Swetha mentioned, um, I work in Australia. I work as an associate consultant at Rawtech and this webinar is part of a series that I'm running together um, with Heis Langeveld, who I know through ISWA um, on food waste. And the reason why we're, we're talking and focusing so much on food waste is because it really is a massive global issue. And the focus of today's webinar is about turning surplus food into animal feed. We have two incredible speakers to unpack this topic and provide their expertise about the opportunities, barriers, risks, and practical solutions. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Karen. Um, now, Swetha introduced her briefly before, but yes, she's the head of research from Feedback and she leads the investigative work in this important space. So Karen, can you just start by telling us a little bit about Feedback's work? Uh, so Feedback is a small um, campaign and IPC um, uh, NGO based in London, but we've done work all over the world and, and all across Europe. We started our return food waste, but now we're really looking at transformation of the whole food system for a health planet and health food people. Well, that's a very big ambition to transform the whole food system. <laughs> and uh, oh, completely. <laughs> So an important piece of that puzzle in transforming the food system is looking at what we're feeding animals. And then that's the focus of, of today's discussion about feeding surplus food to animals. But can you um, take a step back and tell us what do we currently feed to animals? What's the conventional thing to feed animals and livestock? Um, yeah, so currently uh, we feed things, cereals such as wheat, barley, corn, um, and then soybeans, rapeseed, sunflower meal, sometimes also just peas and beans normally. And then often things are added like amino acids, which are uh, the specific proteins like lysine, which is often a limiting factor in the growth of the pigs. And then we do get um, things like surplus food, bakery goods, um, um, yeah, or leftover cereals, leftover sweets and biscuits that already get turned into good food as well. Okay, and so what you're talking about is instead of feeding them the conventional food, um, is feeding surplus food. So what are the environmental benefits of doing that? Why would you instead um, feed pigs and, and so forth this these, uh, surplus food? Yeah, so we're most worried about uh, the production of soya, most of, uh, more than half of which still comes from South America, and so where it drives um, deforestation. And, um, and that is part of this whole picture where the global livestock sector is uh, responsible for 14.5% of global emissions. Um, and I'm just actually going to share a slide with you. Because I'm going to be throwing some figures at everybody. Yeah. Is everybody getting this greenhouse gas emission slide? Yes. Great. So, um, so we've got the global livestock sector, big emitter. For uh, ruminant animals, that's because of um, their digestion and And so, what we um, what we for um, 
calculating what would happen in the EV, we looked at if we used half of the surface fuel from the European Union, from uh, the sectors of manufacturing, catering, and retail, to replace which fuel, we could lead, uh, that could lead to a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions of 5.8 million tons of um, CO2 equivalent. And that's kind of the emissions of over 3 million uh, UK passenger cars um, driven for one year. Um, and on top of that, we could also replace about 800,000 tons of soya that we currently import from Brazil alone. Um, and uh, we will also need less land to produce our food, so if we use unavoidable surface, and that's really important, we want to only use unavoidable the first to to avoid it um, to be produced in the first place. We use that wisely in animal feed, and big pigs are really the best place to um, thrive on this surface. Um, then we can still um, have some meat in our diet. And for the UK, we calculated about 100 grams uh, per person every 10 days. Um, but and in that way, we would use less land than we have. Otherwise, we have to go use other land to grow, say, beans and soya for ourselves. So that's fair land and keep the to a big like the wild and more conservation. Uh, oh, and we asked, uh, did we ask about the economic benefits? Or do you want? So um, economic benefits uh, are interesting as well. So in Japan, we already have a thriving modern industry that turns um, food waste into pig feed. And there, the pig feed is coming from this um, pig feed and surface, which only costs about half of conventional feed. Um, and we've done an analysis for France and UK, and we know there could be savings, but what's really important is that the source of the surface food is relatively close to where we have the pig farms, which is actually the cost of both environmentally speaking and uh, financially speaking is uh, very heavy in the transport of the surface food and then the and then the truth. Um, yeah and really important uh, sorry to interrupt because is to make sure Aaron, that sorry. yeah we're just um, having a little bit of That's trouble right. um, hearing you. Um, is it possible uh, that the earphones uh, may work just to, to get better sound? Okay, but, um, I'm going to I'm going to plug in my, my microphone. I'll try and do I've got it with me here. No so problem. I'll as quick as possible. Yes, no worries. So just while Karen's um, plugging in her microphone. Um, so this is in summary. It sounds okay. like there's a. Is lot this better? Oh, much better. Perfect. Okay, great. I'm so sorry about that. So um, do you need me to go back to anything or for time's sake, shall I uh, just uh, move forward? I'm nearly at the end of this question. But. Feel free to um, just touch on the key points there. So you were talking about the environmental um, benefits yeah. of using surplus treated food and you mentioned yeah. um, greenhouse gas emission savings, which yeah. are massive by the sounds of it, um, yes. as well as uh, the fact that you don't need land anymore, uh, you know, instead of having land to, to grow conventional food, foods like your soya, um, you can then save that land and preserve the forests. Um, and you were talking about the economic benefits, I understand, and you were talking about the, the difference in cost. So I just wanted you to make that point again. How much does it cost farmers to use conventional yep. food versus um, your surplus food? Yeah, so um, in, sorry, I'm having trouble with, uh, in the meantime, with my Zoom as well. Um, so in the in Japan, where we already have a thriving modern uh, industry, Turn up into big feed. There, it costs a half conventional feed. Uh, so that that's a really big gain for the farmers and for the pigs as well there, um, because we we can pass on those benefits in better welfare. Um, and we've done an analysis of costs in the UK and France, and we know there can be significant savings, not as high as, as in Japan, but still significant savings. But what's really important is that with the source of the surplus food is relatively close to the to the uh, pig farms because of the cost, the environmental cost, and the financial cost of the transport. Really important for us is that the processing processing facilities would be owned. By by farmers because in that way we can make sure that it's the farmers who benefit because they are the ones really struggling with the costs of feed and like I mentioned the benefits to be passed on to the, to the pigs. Yeah okay so 50% um, potential savings in the cost of, of feed for animals. Um, when, when farmers um, have the animals how much does the feed make up of their total operating cost? Is it a big component or is it a relatively small component? 
um, of the the, P, the fees of the total, uh, yeah, feed is more than half in Spain. It can be 67% of um, total production cost can be actually pig feed, and in other countries, 55. Yes, I think it's in Europe. I don't know Australia, but it is really expensive everywhere. Okay, so we're talking about 50% of a big number that is potential saving. So it makes economic sense by the sounds of it, as well as environmental sense, to be using surplus food to feed animals rather than the conventional um, feedstock. Um, mm -hmm. So keen to understand, I mean, obviously this is, there's some sort of um, activities happening right now with, with feeding um, animal surplus food, it's not a new thing. Um, but I've also heard that there's a lot of uh, risks involved with these types of activities. We've had previous outbreaks of foot and mouth. So kind of would like to understand what are the risks associated with feeding um, food waste to animals? Yep. Um, so if we leave the surplus food untreated, um, and especially meat, it could contain all kinds of diseases. Just like eating raw chicken would make you ill or would give you food poisoning in the same way if we don't actually heat treat the food waste, then it can make the um, pigs ill as well. And what we're really concerned about in the past and which is why legislation changed in Europe is foot and mouth disease. But right now, more of a concern is African swine fever. And, you know, the world's uh, Organization for Animal Health now says no country is immune from African swine fever. It has struck 50 countries. China is obviously where it um, is strongest. Uh, we've got hundreds of millions of pigs that um, were killed and that's kind of reshaping the whole of the global feed and meat markets. And it's not going to improve. African swine fever is going to spread faster. So we need to be really cautious about that. Yeah. Okay. So, so are those risks higher, um, I guess, when you're using surplus food to feed the animals, the risks of getting those um, diseases? Yeah, but they, they could, you know, African swine fever can pass in many ways. And, uh, um, you know, I'm not an expert on, on the other ways in which it can pass. Um, you know, it often comes through wild boar and so on. Uh, and, and often we can see it spreads through um, sort of a, a tourist leaving a, a sandwich on the side and then that gets eaten. And, you know, so, the, the, <laughs> yeah, um, but we can make sure that we don't have the risk. And it's it's like the chicken analogy. You, we still eat chicken. We don't have legislation stopping us from eating chicken because there might be people who don't cook their chicken properly. So in the same way, <laughs> yeah, it is perfectly safe for pigs to eat what humans eat as long as the food has, has been heat treated. Um, and African swine fever, in fact, is very heat sensitive. So it doesn't even need to cook. African swine fever uh, dies off at 70, 70 degrees Celsius. So it, it's not an issue to, to make the uh, food for the pigs, make it safe. Uh, but what we propose, because what well, the other problem is cross-contamination. So you could have a situation where, um, you know, you're doing everything well, but then your farm worker comes in and, and, and you know, doesn't deal with their own um, ham sandwich again properly, and it, it contaminates um, the feed that was already made safe. So that's why we are proposing only to use specialist off-farm treatment facilities that are strictly controlled by government, as is currently the case in Japan. Um, mm. And in fact, yeah. So take us through the, the process. So you have some yeah. leftover food that you want to feed yeah. to pigs, but you've got to undergo some sort of treatment process. Can you describe um, what happens at that treatment facility that would make it safe? Just at a high yeah, level? And just, I've got a nice um, slide for this as well. Just yeah. sharing it, yeah. I think you've got it, yeah. Yes. Great, so um, you can see sort of the process here. Oh, yeah, the collection is interesting. So it gets collected from the retailers and the restaurants and they already do a screening. So they are already contractually responsible to make sure we don't have forks or cigarette butts in there. And they do some initial, um, um, what you call it, um, separating of nutritional categories. So they might separate out carbohydrates from uh, vegetables and fruit from the meat components, uh, which then helps in step three in nutrition. I'll come back to that. The, the um, bins there are barcoded uh, and that all goes into the computer system. So we have traceability of where the uh, surplus has come from. Then in the same barcodes, we know what sort of food has gone in, whether it was carbohydrates, proteins, um, because that helps us later on to formulate the feed that is adequate for the pigs, nutritionally speaking. Um, <clears throat> and then 
uh, we have all sorts of ways of preventing contamination. So there will still be magnets used to take out anything metallic. Um, and obviously there's a sorting process, a human sorting process as well to make sure that, that the feed is safe. Uh, it gets shredded and then it gets uh, mixed with some liquid because that's where the heat treatment is more effective. So then it undergoes the heat treatment. Uh, in Japan, it would be half an hour, 70 degrees or um, uh, 10 minutes, uh, 80 degrees. But I think in Europe, we'd be looking at a slightly higher heat treatment step uh, just to build in a bigger safety margin because also there's a lot of um, uh, yeah, very concerned authorities here. And then monitoring, it's all about sampling the feed, so it needs to be regularly tested to make sure that it is indeed safe and then transported to the pig farm. So the end product, is that like a slurry or is it a pellet or what's it, what does the end product um, look like? Yeah, so there's two options there. You can have liquid feed or dried feed. We have mostly looked at illiquid feed for two reasons. Obviously, if you produce liquid feed, you can um, you can you have need less heat treatment, so it's cheaper to produce. But also, you can add in what a fermentation step and fermenting the feed um, is really interesting because it brings down the acidity, which helps in the preservation and again in uh, making sure that there is no uh, pathogens that can um, develop again in the feed and it's especially good with foot and mouth for example keeping the acidity low and the fermentation has all sorts of um, it's a bit like you make a pig yogurt and it's really good for their gut <laughs> health yeah. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> in, ja in Japan, in, yeah, in Japan, funnily enough, the, the, the pigs, the pork that is made from this um, fermented feed is marketed as yogurt pork and it's, and it's marketed as a healthier um, pork than, than the conventionally fed one. And we know we have lots of evidence using fermented feed can help you reduce the use of antibiotics in the, in, for the pigs in the first place. Okay. So that's really exciting. But on the other hand, of course, it's, it's only got a two week shelf life if it's fermented and liquid. Um, and it's much costly, much more costly to transport. It's much bigger in volume. So if you dry it into pellets, it's got a higher cost for drying, but it's better to store and to transport. So we understand we're still researching this. There's probably a trade off between distance, transport, uh, shelf life and then and then obviously not all farmers have the they have to have special facilities to deal with liquid feed as well so that's mm. <laughs> so it is quite nutritious for pigs so has there been any um any informational research there about the you know health of pigs on this type of food versus your conventional products yeah um we what we know, what we what has been done is the research on the taste of the pork, and, and that's all coming out very positively. Uh, on the health, it's more to do with the general fermentation. So you can um, uh, so you can you could also um, ferment other types of um, other types of feed. But having said that, in Europe, what we've done is we've effectively forced omnivorous animals, pigs are omnivorous animals, to be vegetarians um, mm. through our legislation. And, and, and there is a real issue with the lack of, of certain amino acids. And we know that, th that there is research that shows that if, if the pigs have the more complete amino acids, they will also, for example, be less uh, prone to turning into tail biting attacks. Now, that's a very complicated thing, the tail biting and, and uh, pigs kind of biting each other because there's all sorts of other factors to do with their environment and stress and so on. But certainly the feed is one aspect of it. And if they have a more varied uh, diet because right now they get fed exactly the same every single day. Well, it changes as the, as they grow as their growth requirements change. But it's not like us, you know, one thing one day you eat one thing. It's a bit like you were being fed cornflakes without milk every morning, every evening, every single day. Just cornflakes <laughs> is the conventional <laughs> feed. And so if we can have this more varied feed, there is evidence that that contributes to their welfare. Yeah. Okay. And so we've talked about the process of turning surplus food into the animal feed. I'm curious to know what kinds of surplus food are able to go through this system. Is there any restrictions or is it any, any surplus food? Is it flat from households? Can, can it take yeah. um, food base from households? Yeah, I'm just going to go back to my, I've got one on my final little slide to share for you. Um, yes. <laughs> So um, 
we know already from manufacturing a lot of um, uh, in that 5 million tons in Europe currently out of the 88 million tons. Oh, sorry, that's additional to the 88 million tons of food waste currently produced. Um, and what we're saying is we can take manufacturing, catering and hospitality, so hotels and restaurants and so on, and um, retail um, safely because it's a little bit easier to control. You can do contracts, you know, contractual arrangements with the suppliers of this surplus and you can have, have a level of training of the staff who deal with, with that yeah. surplus. But if you household, so household surplus in South Korea is used in pig feed as well. And if you have people who are disciplined and there is a, you know, proper controls, they have quite a sophisticated system of collecting the surplus from the household safely and they turn it into feed. But we think that authorities and sort of the way we separate the collection of food waste currently in Europe, it's, we're just not ready for that. I hope that soon we can maybe do um, you know, we could do um, pilots in areas where there is a good separate, separate food waste collection schemes and you can keep it fresh. It would have to be a lot more uh, regular, but the authorities aren't ready. I think we need to just sort of start where we think it's more possible, which is by um, looking at retail catering and, and uh, manufacturing. Those are significant volumes you're talking about because you've got there on that slide, there's a total of 88 million tonnes of food waste and you're saying, 40, 14, 14 million tonnes um, minimum could be potentially diverted in Europe through this type of process. That's not insignificant. So I guess, you know, Europe has this objective to halve the amount of food waste. Um, this you know, animal feed is potentially a, a key strategy for getting there. So what's actually stopping Europe from doing this right now? <laughs> uh, I just one, one little thing about this though, about halving food waste. I think we, we've just been doing other life cycle assessment work and I just want to emphasize how important it is that we emphasize the prevention of overproduction in the first place. It's just Absolutely. so important. And this is just a plan B. But um, what is stopping Europe? It is, I mean, sadly, because we've had lots of problems in, in the feed supply chain, we've had our foot and mouth crisis. We've had the horse meat scandal. We've had the dioxin crisis in feed and it's just authorities are very nervous. And so rather than looking at legislating and providing it properly, they've sort of decided to ban pretty much everything. And, and it, it's, it's a slow process, but things have really changed since we've started our research and have had the experts together and have had the Japanese experts to show how it, how it can be done. They're opening up and in UK right now, um, we're about to have an expert round table in uh, the Department for Environment here um, and with the European Commission as well, so slowly. And also the good thing is in the Netherlands, uh, the Dutch government is actually um, supporting the University of Wageningen, which is I think the most important agricultural university of Europe to start the next phase of research um, on this as well. So things are starting to move, luckily. Oh, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. And so if you, um, so you've got that legislation that's preventing uh, from feeding meat containing surplus food to pigs. Yeah. So what, how would you, like, what are the key parts of legislation you'd like to see changed based on your research to date? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, um, Basically, there's two major changes. The first one is, is a general one that just would reintroduce the use of animal proteins in the diets of non-ruminant omnivorous livestock. And that's already the case. Australia, New Zealand, Japan, the US all allow this. It's just Europe is a little bit the odd one out. Um, yeah. so, that, so that's the first step. Um, and then the second step is really legislate, set the bar very high with tight biosecurity, well-monitored um, treatment of the surplus food in the separate off-farm treatment facilities, uh, which have then adequate official controls. And the thing is, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have legislation around how we should treat um, animal byproducts, and that's done in the rendering industry. And that legislation is very easy to tweak and fine-tune to this new industry. So we, we could do it. Okay. All right, I might leave it at that for now. I have a few more questions for you, but I'm going to move over to our second speaker and we'll come back to some Q&A as well from the audience. So um, yeah. thank you very much, Karen, um, for your insights so far. So my next speaker, Olympia Yaga, is um, from my side of the world, Australia. So we hear a similar accent when you, <laughs> when you hear us speak. But Olympia, as 
as Suitha introduced before, is a farmer, innovator, and a leader in insect farming in Australia. Um, but I learned an interesting fact about Olympia um, the other day when I was reading a bio, which is that she's actually had an insect named after her. So <laughs> before we start, Olympia, do you want to tell us a little bit about that story? Yeah, so I met this amazing entomologist from the CSIRO at a sausage sizzle on Australia Day. <laughs> um, um, and he's a fabulous scientist and uh, we became good friends. And as uh, GoTerra was being established and things were starting, we, you, Brian, Dr. Brian Lassard was um, incredibly supportive of um, what we were doing and, and lent his expertise to a lot of um, the progress that GoTerra had in the early beginnings, uh, mostly around taxonomy um, and sort of helping sort of find additional research that helped us answer some of our questions. Um, and he f recently found a, a, a hermetia species of fly in the Dane tree, which had not been discovered before. And now it's named Hermetia Olympiae. It has hairy eyes. So as a Greek person, I feel like there's a lot of um, <laughs> share common. <laughs> And that's a fantastic story. So um, you, your company, GrowCara, if you could tell us a little bit about it, but there's obviously a connection there between insects and, and what you guys do. But it just uh, if you give us a brief overview of what it is and how it relates to this discussion about um, feeding surplus food to animals. Yeah, sure thing. So go, essentially, GoTerra has developed smart city infrastructure to deliver food waste management decentralised. Um, and we do that with robotic insect farms. Um, so essentially, we've created modular infrastructure that deliver a biological service, or the less sophisticated way of saying it is we've created robots that make insects do jobs. Um, predominantly at, the t at this moment, we've got tech uh, that can farm mealworms, um, and create a human consumption product. And then we have a robotic system that farms black soldier fly, but the inherent nature of using the black soldier fly larva is that it consumes putrescible waste streams. And so we can consume wet waste streams at five tons per day throughput uh, in a 20 foot shipping container. Um, so that's what we're doing. We're making maggot robots down in the capital of Canberra. It's great. Very good, very good. Um, and can you tell us what's so special about black soldier flies? Like what makes them so special compared to like your regular house fly, which you want to swat away? <laughs> I, I kind of have a thing for the house fly now, which um, is an extraordinary thing for an Australian to say. Um, but black soldier fly predominantly uh, are the sweetheart of the insect farming industry. And it's due to a couple of traits around how that insect behaves commercially. So they're a non-vector, non-pest species. So they don't, um, they're not a vector for disease for humans. Um, and that's mostly around how they feed as larva and the traits of the uh, fly itself who can't actually consume food. They can absorb moisture, but they can't, they don't spend their life trying to eat food like a house fly does. Um, and then uh, particularly for Australia, the soldier fly is a great species to farm because it's a non-pest species. And so it's naturalized around the world, but, uh, uh, as well as that, it isn't an, a species that can survive well in external conditions in uh, plague proportions. And that's again about the life cycle. So the fly only lives for nine days and then it dies. And the larva requires large volumes of food waste and can't uh, force pupate as fast as a house fly can. Whereas a house fly has a really long fly stage, super short larval stage. And so it's much easier to, if they become loose and in, in large numbers for them to become a pest. So um, it's mostly like with anything, the, you will always see more common species and it's about their cap the capability to domesticate them easily. So, yeah. Okay. I've never thought about having pets as flies, <laughs> domesticate them. <laughs> <laughs> Not so <much> <laughs> Yeah, uh, so, okay, so what types of uh, food waste do you feed the black soldier flies? So we are a little unconventional when it comes to the traditional insect uh, protein story. GoTerra is entirely focused on the management of waste. Um, that isn't to say that we don't manage uh, true traceability and supply chain um, discussion through to our protein and for us, but it means that we 
are focused on the management of waste and therefore we will accept and process all waste streams. Um, the way we then manage traceability is how we then handle the insects that have come off the back end of that process. And obviously having modular robotic systems that we can batch process different waste streams in is key to that. Um, but for us, the focus is to manage waste. So we accept everything from households, hospitals, hotels, office buildings, mm -hmm. um, conventional uh, warehouse and factory wastes. Um, through to abattoir and agricultural waste streams. So um, our job is to manage food waste effectively and efficiently for our clients. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we manage the quality assurance and the traceability of our product based on what they were fed. So there are insects at GoTerra that are, will never see a livestock feed bin. And that's based on the quality or type of food waste that they were fed. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, so you take all food waste. Um, how do you manage that? And I'm assuming you're talking about all sort of separated food waste, so it has to be free of contaminants, or do you have a contamination management process? So we can handle a fairly high contamination level. Um, yep. then we, uh, the biggest challenge for managing food waste, so the bulk of our food waste is, uh, takes place in the last part. So it's in uh, food prep, um, handling food, poor gross grocery shopping choices, and then plate scrapings, etc. cetera. Um, that's where most of our uh, food waste occurs. And so that's also where the largest volume of error occurs because people are like, oh, that napkin can go in there. Those chopsticks can be there. So for us, again, uh, to compete co effectively with... Um, like uh, with existing organics waste producers and manage managers, we will accept high levels of contamination. Mm -hmm. uh, we've developed uh, technology to be able to process biopack, specifically biopack packaging. So we can, uh, the insects will consume the compostable biopack packaging, mm -hmm. um, the containers, um, all the plastic bag, because it's made of plant oil, not uh, petroleum oil. Um, we can get all of that consumed in our process. Um, so we will take high levels of contamination because of our focus on food waste. Um, w the plastics and difficult waste stream that shouldn't technically be in there um, are come out in the frass. So we sift okay. them from our frass. Okay, so you have some sort of process there to, to remove yeah. Yeah. the non um, food waste yeah. and compostable <laughs> items okay um and what are so you're producing this food um out of the surplus sorry food out of surplus food <laughs> uh, animal feed out of surplus food yeah. how does what, what are the um environmental and economic benefits of that compared to the conventional food yeah so like it's a long-term discussion and i think that you know, we all all of us in the insect protein industry know that we still have a fairly significant way to go before we're at what the livestock feed industry considers true commerciality. Um, but by the same token, there's a huge opportunity for insect protein to deliver on really uh, impactful metrics, even just from a carbon emission perspective. So if you think about the carbon emission, uh, so the CO2 equivalent um, carbon emissions produced from uh, landfilling a thousand kilos of food waste is about 1900. CO2 equivalent. Um, the equivalent of feeding that same thousand kilos of food waste to insects um, it produces around 35 CO2 equivalent. So just out the gate, you've reduced your carbon footprint just by altering and, and um, changing the way we manage that food waste. From a GoTerra perspective, what we've then done, and it speaks to what Karen talked about in relation to supply chains and accessibility to food um, and accessibility to processing food waste and then where, how that food, what you've just made can then go back out to agriculture. Mm -hmm. So the distance, the transport miles of collecting food waste have to be reduced to be more efficient. Mm -hmm. And then subsequently the transport miles of that feed needs to be reduced for the affordability of the feed to um, work out for farmers. And so from a GoTerra perspective, that's where our infrastructure comes into play. So instead of building a large plant every time we need to access or unlock new waste streams, we can just start adding 20 foot shipping containers. And so there's a, uh, a conversation in there and to Karen's point where we must reimagine 
not just like let's manage food waste, but like let's reduce it, then figure out better ways of developing a true supply chain for food waste. Mm -hmm. And like any supply chain, there's going to be places where it's better served going somewhere else, you know, and from Australian perspective, um, we joke a lot. One of our clients is a local brewery here in Canberra. They're a really prominent brewery. So do a lot of traffic. Um, every Thursday we collect and every Thursday the farmers collect and the brewery puts all the, that sells the brewers um, grains straight to farmers and we collect the food waste. Whereas a lot of my counterparts in um, overseas use brewers grain to grow insects. Um, that would I would never win an arm wrestle with a cattle farmer over who win who gets the brewer's grain and I think we really need to start thinking about accessibility of waste and where it, you know how that's going to line up in a supply chain perspective so yeah so you're saying this your solution works quite well in regional locations um, where both the farmers are um, and and some of the, the, the feedstock is yes. so um have you have has it rolled out across australia across regional areas or are you kind of in the more initial phases like it's, what kind of footprint do you have yeah so we're in a, in canberra and um Queanbeyan and into queensland um and this year we'll be moving up uh into sydney and into several smaller um communities uh up the coast through to sydney um and then uh is further expanding in um, the, Queen, the Queensland uh, business. And so um, what we're going to see moving forward is the rolling out of the units to unlock. Again, th these are smaller towns, 30,000, 40,000 people. They are generating meaningful amounts of food waste that create infrastructure challenges for landfill, city council collection. Um, mm. And it's an opportunity to deliver industry for those communities. So create, more uh, jobs, but also to deliver an infrastructure opportunity that usually is unaffordable because the size of the town is too small to afford the conventional option. Mm, and it sounds like a sensible option um, for regional uh, councils and certainly in a place like Australia where we have such large distances and therefore such large travel costs. In my work, I'm often talking to regional councils and they're always raising this as one of the biggest barriers and there's such a need to, to develop local solutions. So it, it does sound like it makes a lot of sense. Um, so take us through your modular system a little bit more. Um, I wanna understand what is the, the capital cost? Like if I was a regional council, for example, and I wanted to say, go Tara, I'd love one of your systems. How much would I have to pay or how does that, how does that work? Yeah, so the modular units cost $100,000 per unit. Mm -hmm. um, and we are a true fee-for-service uh, company. So we are delivering a service. Um, so if you consider, basically what we're doing is bringing landfill to your town that's specifically designed for composting. So we're not necessarily going to ask you to buy it. What we're going to do is charge you a tipping fee to use it. And okay. so what it does then is there's opportunity in a few different ways for that system to be able to be integrated with different infrastructure and supply chains. So if you imagine you could, you know, to divert from landfill, it could sit at the landfill mm -hmm. and then just be the food waste instead of getting tipped gets taken to the unit and processed. Just like any of the bins that we currently have where put your white glass here and your green glass here. It's mm -hmm. a, super similar in its in its application and then same again uh, we'll be doing some trials this year on site trials with intensive agriculture so you know can we process mortalities on site which would be a huge biosecurity opportunity um, to not have you know particularly birds uh, dead birds being transported around um, for decomposition or composting mm -hmm. in other places if we could process those right on site um, there's some opportunities in there where we can really deliver like super close to source um, processing um, that delivers on sort of circular economy, a green um, impact statement, but then also creating like true value. Um, yep. I think that's, yeah, trying to figure out like, there's a circle, sure, we all get it, but like, where do you fit there? And, and what's mm. the right application? I think it's gonna be important. Sure. Oh, just another question about, about the opportunity for, for councils and other people in regional areas. You talked about having a, a fee. Is that a fee per tonne or fee per kilogram? Yeah, so it's a per tonne fee, and just like any council. So when and you go 
drop off at the tip, it's X per tonne, it's the same thing. Yeah, and is that, how does that compare to the landfill costs? Because we're often one of the decision makers, unfortunately, it's reality is how mm -hmm. does the system cost compared to landfill? Yep. Um, it's always the question people ask. Yep. Um, so is it cheaper or more expensive or how does it compare with we're, landfills? And I know not, where yeah. you are as well. <laughs> By and large, we are cheaper. Uh -huh. um, so here in Canberra, we're cheaper than Muggle Lane. Um, we are cheaper into Sydney. Um, and, and it comes down to a few different things, but mostly it's around our proximity. So uh, with other nuances, but really simply, uh, food waste, ma uh, waste management is divided into two parts. Management, so the disposal of the waste and the collection of the waste. Mm -hmm. and the collection of the waste return on an investment is measured by bin lifts per kilometre. So how many times do I have to pick up a bin in how many kilometres before my truck is full? And so you want to pick up one or two or three really big loads and then drive a short distance to a, to a facility. Picking up the small loads, which like I said, there's more of them, takes, costs more money because I'm picking, picking, picking and driving and driving and driving. And then generally, if you think about where most composting facilities and anaerobic digesters are located, they're outside the city limits. So for us, we can be closer proximity logistically um, and we can deliver a, a, a price per tonne that makes it so that the current waste distributors can uh, deliver a price uh, saving back to the client. Sure thing. So we talked about the, the cost comparison at the front end, so for your council who is delivering the food. Now I'm interested in the, the cost at the, the other end um, compared to, you know, you've got this feed product made from um, the, the black soldier fire larvae. Um, how much is that about cost comparable with conventional products or is it more expensive? What's, what's the economics yeah. of that? Yeah, sure. So currently we're more expensive. Um, that's not our long-term goal. We, um, I believe that insect protein needs to become a commodity and not a product. Currently it's mostly a product. Um, people are producing their own products and then they're selling it as a product a specific nutritional value into the market. And I think that's the right choice for where we all are, where people, different companies are in their uh, stage of growth. But I think long-term for this to be, you know, move into more commercial um, phases, we need to, the price has to come down and, and certainly we need to, it needs to be a commodity. Um, and at that point, then we will have unlocked true commercial access because right now, um, despite the value of insect protein, so by and large, you can feed less insect protein and have higher, you know, comparable, sorry, um, production outcomes, but that price point isn't truly commercial. And so um, for our perspective, we're gonna to look to get it down around the cost of organic soy, um, which will still be a pseudo premium price, but I think will mean it'll get into, be included uh, into more feed inclusions over time. Okay. So I'm curious to know what are the barriers um, that you face for broader adoption of your solution? Is it that is it this particular barrier not having having to compete with the the cost of other conventional feed, or is it just a timing thing? Or what, what would see your solution be able to be adopted more broadly across Australia and, and potentially other jurisdictions? I've got to make more. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's just really interesting stage right now the insect protein industry like there's really amazing like true tri trailblazing companies in europe um uh, northern america and, and of course asia and africa and those companies have done a significant amount of legwork in you know developing processes and and getting you know, particularly in the eu de defining really great regulation to push their uh, product through to market australia doesn't have uh a difficulty at this time in so far as whether or not insects can be fed into our livestock feed supplies. So there are opportunities for it to enter into poultry, aquaculture and pet feed mm -hmm. um, under existing regulation. So we are super fortunate in that way, but we're so young and we're so small and it's very difficult to have commercial conversations when you're not dealing with true commercial volumes. Mm -hmm. And so um, and, and, and more importantly, very difficult to have commercial conversations when you haven't, as an industry, yet fully developed an understanding of what best practice, quality assurance, 
you know, all of that. And that is a lot of legwork that has, that must happen. And that, and that legwork is by and large at, on top of the young industry. You know, it is, it is my job as an insect producer to be participatory in um, ensuring that, our industry delivers on its promise of quality and, and best practice. And so how do I develop that? You know, we've been really fortunate in Australia to have great support from industry, Stock Feed Manufacturing, Manufacturers Council, Animal Health Australia, um, have all been working very hard to help the industry um, get its feet. But the biggest challenge for Australia right now is the size of its industry. It's just not big enough. Um, then we wouldn't have a problem selling it well, we need to make more of it. Yeah. Interesting. All right. What, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up to some of the, the questions that have been posed um, from the audience. Um, so we've got about a quarter an hour left and we've got a, a number of questions to get through. I might start um, with, with one Olympia for, for you. Um, so Karim has asked roughly what is the operating cost per ton for treating food waste with the flies? Yeah. So the operating cost per ton, um, I can do it by unit. So it's a five tons of food waste per day. Um, we're looking at a electricity cost of around $3.75 per day. Um, and then one individual will remove, uh, evacuate the unit and reseed the unit every 12 days. And that process takes about three hours. So um, on a unit basis, pretty low. Um, the interesting conversation around insect production though, is that we must produce the flies and that is a whole other conversation on its own, right? So, yeah. Okay, so someone will do have to do the, the maths afterwards <laughs> on um, those figures you provided. So it's not, not an easy dollar per ton at, at hand. <laughs> it, look, it's, it's certainly a, uh, not, it's not, um, when we're well, you know, the, the opportunity is very high and the margins are, are very good, but it's important that like there are some, you know, operating costs, just to manage the waste or operating costs to operate a vertically integrated business are two different things. Yeah, sure thing. Um, I have another question here um, from Kartik. How are temperatures for breeding the flies managed in the nursery? Yeah, sure. So um, we use a robotic systems that uh, deliver um, a set point um, recognition. So basically we tell them the set point, what we want, um, the aviaries to be at certain times of the day and using a program logic controller, which is an industrial computer. Um, we tell that computer to turn on and off heaters, evaporative coolers um, and uh, humidifiers based on what we've told the, the computer the optimal temperature is. But you can start using really cheap, uh, very small um, reptile timers. There's a whole slew of different technology out there for mm -hmm. all stages to, to turn on and off um, based on a set point for sure. Yep. All right, and I might bring Karen off um, mute as well because we've got some more questions here. So I'll, if you guys can um, maybe both potentially answer this question, but we'll start with Karen. So um, we have a question here saying, are there any animals apart from pigs and insects that are best suited to consuming surplus food? Are there any animals that definitely, definitely should not feed surplus food? <laughs> well, it depends the kind of surplus food you're talking about. So your mixed surplus food that has uh, or could have potentially uh, meat products in it should only go to omnivorous animals like pigs, chickens, could also go to um, carnivorous uh, fish as well, if you if you treated it, treated it well. Um, although not much research has been done on it, but that's possible. But what you shouldn't, that mixed surplus where there is potentially meat in there should not go to any ruminants. So not to cows, goats, sheep, any of those, because that's that's where a lot of problems would arise. Um, yeah, so, but you can feed like what we already do, the bakery or the, like Olympia mentioned, the brewers spend grains. There's all sorts of byproducts in the food chain that are entirely plant-based that could perfectly go to cattle as well. Okay, so what is it um, about the meat containing food waste, which means you cannot feed it to a cow? Uh, well, that's that's where uh, Matt Cow's disease came from in the end, if, if you if you trace it back. So it's it's about prion disease um, and, and, you know, ruminants are, are prone to have prion disease and it comes through um, meat products. I mean, yeah, I'm not an expert on that, but I know we, we should really not not do that. 
Okay, so meat containing products are fine for pigs, um, but not yeah. fine for, for cows. And and for cows, it's fine as long as it's it's vegetarian. It doesn't contain any meat. That's yeah, I think yeah. it's for me. It's quite simple. It's you've got omnivorous animals. Yes, meat herbivorous animals no <laughs> yeah yeah nice and simple um any okay and um i've got a question here from a, a person called paul realizing the level most developed nations are in now in managing and reprocessing food waste um and encouraging this is one of the major, major challenges that is faced in west africa so sorry there's a bit of an introduction to this question food waste forms more than 65 percent of our waste and all goes to landfill some of these processes are capital intensive um but is there any way as well we can reduce our food waste to landfill and reprocess it for animal feed and other uses that are less capital intensive in ghana so i think to summarize that question so i was reading it out but i think they're looking at okay context is ghana uh, they would like a less capital intensive solution for managing food waste. Any, any thoughts on yeah, that? Look, insect farming um, is particularly capitally, it can, it can be both. So, you know, I think what you find in, in countries with um, more industrialization um, and they have the opportunity to enjoy the privileges of that um, and can, you know, for us building big robots, um, that seems a, a great way to deliver on, on an infrastructure piece. But the flip side is that it, insects can grow in a bucket. It doesn't need to be an autonomous bucket and it doesn't need to be uh, have facial recognition or AI software that drives the bucket. And so there is, um, if you do some Googling, there are some incredible African insect farms that are delivering a very um, capitally... Um, efficient um, processes for managing food waste um, using insects and the interesting and, and benefit <laughs> of that is that they're also creating jobs because there's no um, automation the, the the requirement of human labor exists and so there's this really great opportunity to create to lift um, certain regions up by implementing an insect farming uh, business in those regions. So I think um, that there is some really interesting things to be done there with insect farming, both on, on both sides of that spectrum. Hmm, interesting. Um, and I've got another question here. What kind of investments are needed to assist in reducing food waste or reusing food waste to turn into animal feed or alternative options? So um, BCG Group stated that food waste is a $2 trillion problem or opportunity. Agriculture from the farm is the best opportunity in the particular horticultural industry. How can we turn this into a commodity is the question. I, so from, I come from an entrepreneur, so like space right now, because that's the stage that my company's in. And, and so, um, and, it, and this speaks a lot to what I think, like we know what's happening today. And I think what we really need to actually think about is what's going to happen tomorrow. And um, poten poten potentially I'm a little bit raw to this conversation because I, we've just gone through incredible fires and, and hailstorms. Um, and so um, I feel this uh, very acutely, but what we're wasting today will not be wasted tomorrow. And, and I'm actually emphatically certain of that. Um, we uh, well over a hundred million dollars was invested in venture by venture capital into startups that were focused on converting pre consumer food waste into something, whether that was a fast moving consumer good or to feed or to something else. And that's in America alone. So a large volume of money is being invested into um, recycling pre consumer food waste. Add to that the ugly food movement war on waste, um, a lot of programs to recycle food for charity, like in Australia, we have Oz Harvest. You, you, can, you can already see that the writing is on the wall that pre-consumer food waste is going to start to be well and truly um, developed into strong supply chains. Um, add to that, climate change is going to diminish our capacity to produce as efficiently as we have in the past. And I think that in, to, in turn will also improve our management and use of food because we will start to have less opportunity to um, treat it as, as if it is um, our right. Um, and so I think what we really are seeing now is, is that this is the pre-consumer food waste particularly, I think in the next five years we're gonna see really robust 
uh, conversations and supply chains being built, technology being invested. Um, we're already seeing it and I think it will only grow. So if you want to look at some of that, you can look at Ag Funder. There's quite a lot of articles in there. Um, from an Australian perspective, we've got the University of New England just uh, uh, built, has built uh, technology to create uh, chicken, pelleted chicken feed out of food waste. Um, we've got Fable, which is making um, a shiitake mushroom meat. Um, there's a whole slew of companies that are already looking at types of food waste waste streams that can be converted into and valorised at the front end. And I think we're only going to see more of that. Mm. Yeah. May, I, may I add one thing to that? Um, I think um, aside from investment uh, back to the prevention of overproduction in the first place, we also have to take into account um, that we need changes in the way our supply chains operate. Um, and especially if the supply chain, if the retail end of the supply chain is very concentrated, as is the case in the United Kingdom, where it's just, you know, under 10 large supermarket chains that control 90 something percent of the food um, supply chain they, they they have so much power they push a lot of the risks of food production back onto the primary producer and then we get last minute order cancellations um, difficulties in forecasting that isn't taken very seriously um, rejections of uh, still a lot of rejection on the cosmetic standards just little blemishes and that's actually used as an excuse to manage a higher supply and we we have now now, um, um, legislation around unfair trading practices in Europe and we need to implement that and there's a lot of work there so we need to also see how yeah to decommercialize some of our supply chain operation in a way and and, and make it a more um, more equal relation across from the primary producer to prevent food waste from uh, or food from being produced when it's not necessary and I think in other countries it might be more an infrastructure uh, uh, theme still where we need just access to roads and, and storage and so on that it depends a bit on the context. Mm, absolutely so that's a, that's a discussion I've heard before that you raised Karen about yeah. the market power of retailers and how they yeah. um, can use that power to um, require producers of, of um, food products to to grow more than they need or to, to grow to different standards and they can reject loads space and that so yeah. It is an interesting, interesting one and, and um, probably a topic for another webinar as we're wrapping up. <laughs> um, but it's a very important one you raise and I think this has been a theme throughout today. We're focused very much on animal feed and the opportunities there and, and it is clear from the discussions that there is a huge opportunity to, to feed um, more surplus food to animals. There's clearly technology available. You mentioned, Karen, the technology in Korea and Japan and Olympia, your example from Australia. So there is that massive opportunity um, with the right supporting legislation and, and finance and so forth to, to bring that opportunity forward. Um, but another thing from today, which I think is really positive, is to recognise that this is just one piece of the puzzle. And if we look at that food waste hierarchy at the top, is to avoid the generation of food waste. And Olympia and Karen, you both touched on that and the massive opportunity we have um, to really focus on that. Um, and then next, of course, after avoiding food waste and redistributing it to, to humans to feed, to feed humans is then um, feeding it to animals. And then under that is the compost and anaerobic digestion and turning um, food waste into that, which is where I see a lot of the, the conversations focused on um, with, with the types of, you know, the councils and, and other um, people I work with. So anyway, thank you very much, um, Olympia and Karen. I, I think that was a really super informative uh, session and you both have a lot of expertise um, and knowledge to add. So um, thank you very much. And um, the webinar from today, I understand, is has been recorded and will be available on the WasteWise um, website. Um, I'll also be writing up a summary of some of the key takeaways and putting that up on my blog, um, beyondfoodwaste.com. So you can check that out there. Um, but yes, thank you very much for your time today. Terrific. So good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Kat. Thank, thank you. you. So much. Yeah, it, it, it was a very formative panel. And thanks a lot, Kat, for uh, putting this together and for moderating this panel really well for us. And uh, yes, uh, thanks everyone who tuned in today. And uh, the for anyone that's registered, you will have access to the panel uh, at any point in time. If you haven't registered, we will have this up on our website in another 15 days. 
Um, next week, we have another panel, which Adam Reed is going to moderate. It will be up for, uh, it'll be open for registration from tomorrow. It's going to be on the climate crisis. So be sure to subscribe to our newsletter and you will get updates about all the panels. So thanks a lot. Thank you all. Have a good day wherever you are. Bye-bye.